Hello, welcome to another episode of the podcast of Progressus, uh, which uh, is shot on the occasion of uh, the event of the event Singularity U Czech Summit, which Progressus is a proud partner of. My name is Thomas Braverman and I'm ex, an ex-CEO of Heureka Group, which is the biggest e-commerce platform in nine countries of CEE. Now let's get to our guest. Let me welcome here Jos Dirks. Jos, thanks a lot for coming. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Jos is a global speaker, best-selling author, tech entrepreneur, an education and innovation consultant and many other things, right? I saw yesterday your presentation on, on the event, which was, which was really great. And actually I would start uh, with that. Uh, it was called the future of education, how AI changes learning. So tell me, how is actually AI changing, how is it changing learning and education in reality? I think it's a great question. And obviously, you know, when ChatGPT kind of burst into our living rooms in November 2022, everybody started really thinking about, okay, this technology is very much here now. So What's changing is the way in which we start to frame our thinking around the exponentials and what really is out there, what's tangible, what can we start implementing. However, at its core, I really believe it's very important to always remember that learning is learning. Education remains education. The tools that we're going to have access to are continuously changing. But at the heart of what learning really is about You know, that is about having a curious mind or asking the right questions or being open to new experiences or self-regulation or standing up for yourself, whatever it is. Um, so while we focus so much on AI, because obviously, you know, like I said, it burst into our living rooms in November 2022, this ultimately is another tool that we have access to. And in this case, it's an exponential one. Mm -hmm. I think you were uh, talking about AI assistant. Now we have your ChatGPT, like you said, and Bark. But how actually, how do you imagine the AI assistant to the kids? Because, you know, the thing is, at schools in the Czech Republic, usually devices are not really welcome. But how else, but with the devices, you can use the AI tool. So what do you think about like the, the real um, like usage of, of the AI in practice? I mean, well, tell me a little bit more about why the devices here are You tell me more about, because I don't know a little bit about your device policy for students. It differs. The, the, the schools have it differently. My kids are at a school which has it forbidden, except for some particular lessons, but they cannot use it, for example, during the breaks and so on. Which honestly, uh, um, I'm not sure about that, but it has some sense because if, you know, if the students, if the kids can use their devices during the breaks, I can imagine that they'll not talk to one another, they'll not develop their social skills and so on. So it has its sense. But, you know, the thing is that while uh, or uh, because we will definitely be influenced by AI and AI will be a really great tool for the kids, then the devices will have to be allowed, right? Mm -hmm. So devices are, are complex, right? I mean, it's not really a conversation that I specialize in um, device usage in classrooms. And I know different schools and different governments have different ways of looking at, um, you know, what they want to use and why. But if it comes to artificial intelligence, one way to frame your thinking around it is either way, this technology is here now. Mm. So our ethos is let's find the best ways in which to leverage it in the classroom, which is why in our case, as part of the emphasis on pedagogy, we really ensure that even the AI mentor, just like a human teacher, just like a parent or an aunt or an uncle or a good friend might say, hey, let's go for a walk or let's listen to some music or let's go cook something together, right? We encourage um, the learning journey, even with the AI, to replicate such an engagement. So for example, hey, you've been studying for two hours. Why don't you take a break? Or mm. if your mindset's struggling a little bit, why not go meditate? Mm. So it's not about keeping kids on devices. And again, I'm not a device expert, um, but it's about getting them to have a healthy relationship mm. with the technology that's out there anyway. Mm. By the way, 
uh, the last guest of this podcast was Mick Mann. I don't know if you saw his presentation yesterday. He specialized in yeah. metaverses yeah, yeah, and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. And we were discussing actually VR mm -hmm. and the usage, the use case for the education. And it's just awesome, you know, mm -hmm. instead of learning what the rulers were during some, you know, medieval age or so, mm -hmm. you'll just experience with your own senses and, and you know, vision and etc the medieval age and you'll remember so much more so and by the way uh, ai also to a certain ex extent powers the metaverses these days so i i can also see a, um, a connection there i can't wait for that by the way okay uh you yesterday uh mentioned actually some of the countries how they how they um what they do in terms of ai at school you mentioned singapore india do you have some examples what how, how the different countries approach the problematics yeah sure so i really believe that you know every country is going to emphasize its own we heard this in multiple presentations yesterday is going to emphasize its own vision its own ethos um its own access to technology so it's a really it's a really personal journey um in the space of exponential tech and there are many different countries doing very cool work and others that are watching are upskilling their people first. So we see a range of different interpretations when it comes to artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it's important how the country actually adapts, adapts it. Um, and I hope the Czech will do, will adapt it well. You are doing certain things already, which I highlighted yesterday as well. Um, your new minister of education wants to have a policy around AI, bringing it into primary, secondary classrooms. Um, you have Digi Hazel Havel, um, which also engages with students one on one. So there's room for exploration. And I think people want to be able to see inside this black box of machine learning and artificial intelligence, but we can't. Mm. And we have to be comfortable with the unknown. We have to be comfortable with exploration. We have to be comfortable with asking the right questions. And if that's something that different countries are doing, that's where you make the progress. Good, let's move on. Um, yesterday, you were also talking about implementing AI into the companies. As far as I remember, you were mentioning some steps would have to be taken. And then you were actually talking about automating and also augmenting some of the things. Tell us more about that. Yeah, that's a great question. So what I love everything that, you know, every when we think about exponential technology, it's kind of like thinking about the universe, right? You start to think about endless opportunities, endless possibilities, and that's great. But when we go back on Monday morning to our workplace, how are we actually implementing? And that can feel really overwhelming for people. So I know you're an ex-CEO. You understand that if you built the company from scratch, you understand every single task that goes into every single job. That's what makes you a great leader. And I'm sure you had that as well. So even when we think about AI, we need to just break it down. What problem are we trying to solve? How do we have the data? Do we have the infrastructure? Do we have the talent to solve this problem? If not, where do we source it? So what I was referring to yesterday is really about breaking down the way in which we think about implementing an AI project or building something new, but making sure that you stay zoomed out and zoomed in, making sure that you have the pieces lined up so that you can actually execute against your grand vision especially with exponential technology, that can feel a little bit overwhelming because it feels like we have to do so much at once. But all we have to do is understand which steps to take that are going to get to us to our end goal and treat it like a marathon because we've really, we really are there now. Mm. It's a bit of a different ride. And the difference between augmenting and automating. Yeah, I love that. Awesome. So this is really based on thinking around You could technically think, okay, well, artificial intelligence is going to take over all these jobs. That's something that a lot of people feel and fear. True. But if you really think about it, there are so many different skills, even with what you're doing right now. Could I have this conversation with an AI avatar, voice, voice GPT, whatever? Yeah, probably I could. But there are so many more steps that you take every single day to show up here and have this engagement. 
You can navigate a difficult moment in the interview. You can navigate a trickier question. You're reading my body language constantly. You're adjusting to the tone. So we are engaging in multiple ways. So if we really think about the automation, the automation might come in when it comes to transcribing and editing. Hmm. Maybe those are ways in which you'd like to apply artificial intelligence to the work that you're doing. But ultimately, your skill set is not one that can be fully automated. I caution and add the word yet. <laughs> um, so the second question we want to ask is, what is the value of automating? Say we could have a conversation. Again, we can. But say, you know, we're like, all right, let's, let's really entertain this idea and have this entire thing fully AI driven. What's the value? What really is the value? Because through the exchange, you and I both grow as people and the crew and the cast and everybody grows as people. We are an experience richer. So for me, that's a really nice way to start thinking about, okay, jobs are made up of tasks. Certain tasks can be automated. Certain tasks can be augmented, i.e. changed by AI. So we need to understand where each of those fall. And then we assign value to it and write, all right, well, that should be automated or that should be augmented. But ultimately, I want to maintain the connection between two people. That's what I would like to do. Hmm. So if I understand it correctly, if I use the case of uh, the company I was uh, leading, Heureka, which is a price comparison. So automating is, for example, using, using AI while well, uh, in an automated way is, for example, to pairing the different offers fully automated. But then we were uh, creating different articles where it can be augmented by AI because in the end, the person needs to do something, needs to correct, needs to put some value added to the articles, some feelings and stuff like that. Is it, do I understand it correctly? That's a great example. I think writing is an interesting one because the, the um, functionality of writing from artificial intelligence, it's actually pretty good. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But I would even suggest like, what about your teams brainstorming together in a room? What if they needed energy? What if they wanted to build a new feature onto your app, for example? That might be better done in conversation. By the way, they can still invite AI to join them in the meeting, right? Have it as a fourth or fifth team member, it doesn't matter. But collective intelligence, our diversity of thought in those moments is where great ideas are born. So. 100%, I think your example is close. I would just also kind of encourage you to look at it slightly differently. And ultimately, even some of the things I'm talking about when it comes to automating, you getting in your car, driving here this morning, greeting the crew, setting up the space, those are all things that you're still doing. Those mm. are still parts of the task. They're part of the list of things that you have to do to get guests here with you today. So even thinking about it that way. Yeah, get it. And, and we've had access to technology that automates and augments our jobs for the, since the beginning of time. Mm. So nothing has changed there. This one is exponential, like I said earlier, which makes a difference. But ultimately, we can decide, all right, these tasks have value in being automated or augmented. Mm. In my experience, it's, it's just important in a company to do it actively not to wait for anything and the board needs to be involved because it will not happen by itself the people it, it has to be really well discovered how ai should be used or could be used in every single part of the company starting from the top to the bottom that's what i think let's move on yours you are an author if i understand it correctly recently you finished your third book right yes i'm Yes, it's going to be published in a month to, in a month from time. today. It uh, will be in the shelves in bookstores. <laughs> Why Great Ideas Die, that's mm -hmm. the name of the third book. What mm -hmm. is it going to be about? Tell us as much as you can. <laughs> and I understand that people will have to wait. <laughs> no, no, that's kind of you. Thank you. Um, well, Why Great Ideas Die is essentially what the title suggests. It's an amalgamation of ways in which to think about keeping ideas alive in the 21st century and the different aspects that should be taken or could be taken into account. Um, the emphasis is also very much on the cerebral self, so how our brains work and think and, and why we have certain thought patterns, but also the somatic self. How are we breathing? How are we moving? How are we able to energetically pick up on the communication of a space or a team or a new person or a culture? Why? Because those are the exact skills that we're going to need that continue to differentiate us from technology. 
Interesting. So it's going to be available on Amazon or where can... Oh, it's ready for pre-order now. Okay. Um, and yes, absolutely ship worldwide and yeah. Okay. And the last uh, two books, Tackled and Girls Do Good. Uh, do I understand it uh, that uh, Girls Do Good is actually a fairy tale or what is it about? No, that's lovely. Girl, they are so cool. These The girls that we feature in this book that they are almost like... Like a fairy tale. Yeah, they're amazing. <laughs> well, they're just such wonderful girls and that book was great to write. We, um, from idea to bookstore, took us about, I think, six months. It was just the most beautiful collaboration between the illustrator and the characters we featured. But we... We worked with 11 girls that changed the world in their own ways. We had an inventor, we had a um, artist, a sailor, you know, this 14 year old that sailed around the world. And we tell all these stories using augmented reality, but we also have coloring in because for many kids, you know, coloring, coloring in is just a really important to, um, skill to learn, especially in early childhood. Um, and it brings the stories to life. So they start to embody the characters and think about all the things that they can be in the world of tomorrow. So that was a really fun book to write. And um, yeah, Tackled was was interesting as well. We interviewed almost 800 boys and young men to understand challenges that they face around masculinity or okay. bullying or, yeah. Interesting. Thank you. You traveled a lot. Uh, on your web, I could have uh, read that you visited more than 110 countries, right? Which is more than a half. Yeah. Uh, which country? Uh, and you lived in 15, is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, can you even name them? Yeah, right. So funny. I'm like tired. I, th I think it might be slightly under half, which is crazy. But um, the world is such a beautiful, beautiful, vast space. We are so, you know, so blessed to be here. Um, but I, yeah, Brazil, Bangladesh, Spain, Senegal. Canada, Norway. It's been a really beautiful range um, of countries. Which one did you like the most? People often ask me that. I, 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 know, I, know, I know. I know. I know. I <laughs> know. And I never, ever answer it because I actually don't have an answer. I really, really have deep appreciation and respect for every country that I've had, you know, the, the gift of go traveling to or meeting people from. Like, it's such a gift. And I... No, I don't really. You know, whatever you would answer, whatever country you would select, my answer would be the same. And that would be that, well, you have not lived in the Czech Republic, because if you have, you would name the Czech Republic. Yeah, yeah, fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. I must say, I was so, it was so great because we got this list of like 10 things to do while we were in Prague from the event organizers. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, but when? Because they booked our schedules, you know, pretty full. And I, every time I'm in the tag, I get goosebumps now, but like just looking at your beautiful city, I mean, it's, Prague is such a beautiful city. And I've traveled a little bit around the Czech Republic, like to Carlo Vivari. And um, I was in Prague last summer. I just, ah, I just, it's such a beautiful city to take in. So, yeah. And good, it's good to live in, honestly. I bet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think, uh, back to the traveling, I think it's so important to travel nowadays. I mean, the, the, the atmosphere is that you almost should be ashamed of traveling because of, you know, the emissions while flying. But I think that's a big mistake because uh, honestly, I think, you know, experiencing other countries and nations make you, you know, more matured and make you a better person, more developed, you help your country more, etc., etc., etc. So I would very much encourage everybody to travel. Would you agree with me? I find it a really difficult question. I think um, the preservation of our earth should be a, an absolute priority. And I know everybody does what they can. I know I do what I can. And I've made many different changes in my life to accommodate a more sustainable way of living. And I really, really hope everybody does that. I also really appreciate Companies like Heart Aerospace and H2 Fly, I believe it's H2 Fly, that have set the beautifully ambitious goal of being um, net zero by 2025. And um, I know with the maritime industry as well, you know, their 2030 IMO goals aligned with UN SDG 13 to tackle climate change, I think 
are critical. And that being said, I also understand your side and traveling does make us uh, richer. Richer. You know, uh, I was podcasting um, Carlo van der Weyer. Uh, he had a presentation oh, yeah, yesterday. Yeah cool guy really and his presentation was awesome and we tackled this topic and he was actually uh, explaining the future of the aviation using I don't remember the technicalities but it, it actually the future is in using um, how is it uh, uh, artificially produced uh, fuel something like that technical fuel which is carbon neutral so I think there is a way, there is always a way, uh, there is always a way how to do the things uh, uh, sustainably, including the aviation that fulfills me with optimism, really. I love, love what you're saying. Um, I think it's the same though, you know, and I agree, Carlo is great. He's actually um, from the Netherlands and I always think we need to consider things like with EVs, with electrical vehicles. I don't have a car, I ride my bicycle, so I don't really know the ins and outs, the technicalities of the lithium batteries. But I also know that that is a heavy weight on the environment. You know, ultimately, humans are so funny because with less, with just a little bit less on everything, we would be so much more sustainable. Um, and I, I do find that ironic that by just scaling back and being maybe more mindful um, we could just actually undo a lot of these problems that we've caused um, Mother Nature. And at the same time, I do, like I said earlier, have immense respect for the people who are putting their intelligence towards building better ways to travel. It's, it's awesome. Mm. And the Netherlands is really cool because we do ride our bikes a lot. Yes, you do. Which is fun. You do. I hope uh, we will... Um, get there too in That's Prague. Great. We are one of the worst, honestly. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I do have my uh, electro bike, and nice. I use it in Prague every day. Nice. I love it. Not only because of the fact that it's sustainable, but also because I love, you know, traveling to work and getting fresh air and relaxing. It's much more relaxing than you know to travel by car in the traffic jam. So it has both objective and subjective reasons, awesome. but I do love it. Anyway, uh, Jos, I have a last question, which I, which I ask every Please. guest, and that is, if you think that the world will be better or worse in a hundred years time, and why? Oh my gosh, what do they say when you ask them? I, you know what, I liked uh, the answer of Mick the most. He said, he said that I'm optimistic because if I'm not optimistic, it will go wrong. It's like with the economy. Economy is very much based on the sentiment. Whatever the people feel it will be, it will really be. So I think we don't have any other option but to be optimistic. Don't you think? That's absolutely. No, for sure. Like, I'm definitely an optimistic person. Um, and I think to, the, to answer your question, I, I love Mick and I love what he said, um, but I would say you know, it'll just be as beautiful as we're willing to see it as. And it, and our world is just, it's an incredible place. So I hope we, yeah, I hope we continue to honor it and see it that way. Hopefully. And the thing is, either there will be no world or it will be better. <laughs> Hopefully. It's funny. <laughs> um, for now, I think focusing on, on, you know, what we can do in the present even while we're having these big zoomed out conversations about exponential technology is, is key. Thank you very much just for uh, being here. It was a pleasure. Have a great day in Prague. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Bye.